What's up, guys? Stay tuned for the conclusion of our latest episode, The Mark of the Beast, here today on The Last Things Podcast. So you'll know what you're doing when you take on the mark. You know what it is, you know what it represents, and you know what what you can and cannot do unless you have that mark. So these things now, like the, the, the chips in your hands and the barcodes, they're not the mark of the beast right now, but I do believe that they are a precursor to it. And then the COVID vaccine, no, it's not the mark of the beast. However, I also consider it to be a precursor to the mark of the beast. Why? Because remember, for a time in the beginning stages of the vaccine, they were, it was a government mandate. Everybody had to take it, just like how the false prophet is going to do. He's going to require everybody to take the mark of the beast the same way how the government was mandating everybody in the beginning to take on to take the COVID vaccine shot. It's going to be the same way in the end times with the mark of the beast. Excuse me. I'm not saying that the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast because it's not. So let me get that out the way right now. It is not the mark of the beast. It is not the um, the, the chips on in that some people are getting in their hand right now. That's not the mark of the beast. These barcodes that are coming out, it's not the mark of the beast. Because think about it, we can buy and sell any, we can buy or sell anything right now without a mark. So these things are not a mark they're not the mark of the beast. Now, are they precursors? Is it like a warm up to how it would be when it's time when the when it's that time for the mark of the beast? Absolutely, they are. I, now that I do believe they are precursors. Okay, so let's look at something else too. Now, the number six six six. Every the, for years. Everybody has always tried to come up with some meaning as to 666, what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Now, there's a, a, a thing that people use. It's called gamma tree, I believe, G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A, which is pretty much like an example would be like every letter represents a number, right? It has, every letter represents a number. So for example, if we're using this, uh, if we're using this correctly, let's say Satan. Satan's name in Hebrew, his numeric value, remember every letter is supposed to equal to a number. So that's the system that they use, right? So Satan's name in Hebrew would be 364. That's his numeric value. That's his name in numeric value in Hebrew, right? Another one is Eleazar. Eleazar is Moses' nephew. He's Aaron, he's Moses' nephew, Aaron's son, right? He His number would be 318, right? So using that system, it said that the number 666 will equal to the name of the Antichrist, right? Now, here's something key. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's scroll to uh, verse 7. I want to read this to you. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Now, notice what Paul is saying here. Remember we talked about this, the restrainer? The restrainer is the reason why the Antichrist is not taking over right now, right? 
If you want to, um, we covered this episode, we covered this in episode 25, I believe, the, the restrainer as to who he is, right? Go, if you're looking at this or you're listening to it and you want to know the identity of the restrainer or who he is, go to episode 25. It's titled The Restrainer, I believe. So, but here, Paul says the restrainer is holding the Antichrist back. That's why he has not taken over, right? Now, when the anti, when the restrainer steps out of the way, as we read, then the man, verse eight says this, then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. So when the restrainer moves out of the way, we'll know who the antichrist is. We'll know. So if that's true, then that means that happens at the moment of the abomination of desolation, because the Bible says when that event takes place, we'll know, we'll, we'll know who he is, right? So when we see the abomination of desolation take place, we'll know the identity of the Antichrist. When the Holy Spirit moves out of the way, the Bible says then that's when his identity will be revealed. So we see here, so the number 666, what does it mean right now? We don't know. We can take a estimate as to what we believe it represents, who we believe we represents. But guess what? If what the Bible says is true about his identity being hidden until a certain time, then that means that we, we're not going to know what 666 represents until the Antichrist identity is revealed. When his identity is revealed, that's when we will know what 666 represents. That's when we'll know. You won't know until then. People have come up with so many different, different ways and strategies throughout years of trying to find out what 666 represents. But guess what? The Bible says his identity is going to be hidden until a certain time. When that time happens, then he'll then he will be known all over all over the world, right? So if that's the case, then it would also stand to be stand to reason that the number 666 is going to be the same way. You're not going to know what it means until the identity of the Antichrist is revealed. When that happens, then you'll be able to figure out what 666 means. But until then, you're not going to know what it means. People have are just go stir crazy over trying to come up with every kind of um, inkling as to what it means. I, I heard Chuck Missler say um, he was making a comment about some about this six six six. He was saying um, he was talking about how people have come up with so many different ways and viewpoints and strategies. And he said this: What does it mean? It means that if you butcher the numbers long enough, they'll say anything. I just fell out laughing. He said it was a form of torture. He said, if you torture the numbers long enough, it'll, it'll admit to anything. And that's what we've been doing throughout all these years. We've been torturing 666 for so many years. We just, it's like, okay, poof, that's what it means. That's what it means. That's what it means. But that's not the case. The Bible says the Antichrist identity is hidden until a certain time. So as long as his identity is hidden, the true meaning of 666 is going to be hidden. And you're not going to know what it really means until you find out the identity of the Antichrist. When his identity is revealed, I guarantee you, then you'll know what 666 means. What? OK, but you're not going to know it until then. All right. So now, having said that, I want to take a look at something because a lot of people ask this question. Um, let's scroll down to Revelation 14. I want to look at something real quick. It is verse 9 through 11. Okay, now, Matthew chapter 12, 32. It talks about, do I have it pulled up here? I don't, I don't. But Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. It talks about any sin, you know, it talks about any sin can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which cannot be forgiven. It is what we call the unpardonable sin. Blasphemy, I pulled up the definition of blasphemy. 
Blasphemy is defined as the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence of, for God. The, excuse me, the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God. Now, the Bible says, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, if you insult the Holy Spirit, if you show content for the Holy Spirit, or, or you show a lack of reverence for the Holy Spirit, Jesus said that sin cannot be forgiven in this world or the next world. It is what we call the unpardonable sin. That's the one sin that cannot be forgiven, right? Why am I discussing this? I'm discussing this because look at Revelation chapter 14, verse nine. This is what it says. Then a third angel followed them shouting, anyone who worships the beast and his statue or who accepts his mark on the forehead or the hand must drink the wine of God's wrath. It is poured out undiluted into God's cup of wrath and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb. Verse 11, the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever and they will have no relief day or night for they have worshiped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. Let this encourage God's holy people to endure persecution patiently and remain firm until the end. I'm gonna stop right there. Do you see that? Verse 14, uh, chapter um, chapter 14 of uh, Revelation. Revelation 14, verse nine. Anybody who takes on that mark, you are automatically doomed. You, you are automatically doomed forfeited your right to salvation, you have automatically got a spot in hell reserved for you. That's why I talk, That's why I was talking about in Matthew what Jesus talked about blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin, in my opinion. Taking on the mark of the beast is another unpardonable sin. There's two of them as far as I'm concerned. Blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, and we see here, you take on that mark, there's no salvation for you. You have forfeited your salvation. That's why we, that's why it's so important. To remember when I was talking about talking about, you know, the parents and how they are with the kids and want to give them everything. And in those times, you might want, you can't, it might be something that they want, you can't give them, but because they want it so bad. You'll take on the mark just to give them what they want. And the process of doing that, you have forfeited your salvation. You already have a spot in hell reserve. Man, there was a movie on one of these uh, internet channels. I can't remember the name of it. I can't remember the name of the channel. But it was basically, it was a movie about an interview that a reporter was doing with the Antichrist. He already knew who the Antichrist was. He knew who he was. So he had come in. He was a reporter who was, I think it's called Interview with the Antichrist or something like that. But basically, he was interviewing the Antichrist. And, the, and he began to say something. And the Antichrist say, why are you worried? You've taken on the mark, haven't you? And, and you know, he co they didn't show it, but he covered up his arm. So you knew he had already taken on the mark. So in essence, the Antichrist is telling you what you worry for. <laughs> you already going to hell, really. W what you tripping about, right or wrong or whatever, at the end of the day, it's not going to matter for you. It's kind of... I don't know if you got remember, there was a movie called Drag Me to Hell years ago where this young lady, she was a bank teller and this old gypsy lady came in and she could have helped the gypsy lady, but she chose not to. because She's thinking about a job. So the gypsy lady put a curse on her and said, in three days, you're going to be dragged to hell. Right. And she, in the whole movie, she's going through all these different things to try to break this curse. Right. And at the end, and she thought she broke the curse. But then at the end of the movie, when it was supposed to be a happy ending, we see that she didn't break this curse. And at the at the end, she um, she was dragged to hell. Right. Right. At the end of the movie. 
that's how it's going to be if you take on that mark of the beast. You you forfeit your salvation and you'll be dragged to hell too. You will be dragged dragged on to hell. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. Uh, and, and another reason why I'm discussing is because people say, oh, well, it, you know, it says, Jesus said that's the only sin that can be forgiven, that can't be forgiven, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So people will think, okay, well, because, um, because of the, um, well, if that's the case, then if you take on the mark of the beast, you can be forgiven as well. But we just read here in the Bible, it says, no, you won't. No, you can't. If you take on that mark, there's no forgiveness for you. There's no salvation for you. You, you can't be saved. So when we talk about the unpardonable sin, in my opinion, there's two of them. There's the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, and then there's taking on the mark of the beast. You, one of those, you do one of those two things, or even both. This, this is some evil people in the world who do both. But one of those two things, there's no longer no salvation for you, okay? Now, I want to give you an example of being separated. I read this before. It said, God will grant their request to be eternally separated from him. Taking the mark will be a blasphemous act of willing defiance against God. Receiving the mark of the beast is essentially worshiping Satan. They have made their choice to serve Satan and turn from God. When people make that decision during the tribulation, God will grant their request to be eternally separated from him. I, I read that statement. I was just blown away like, wow, it taught really, really brings that into brings that into focus of what you're really doing. When you take on that mark, you really are turning away from God. You are necessarily saying, I, I worship Satan as the great head. I worship him. I worship whatever. I, 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 all hell, King Satan. It, it's like Captain America. In the Avengers movie, I think it was Endgame, when he was on the elevator and he was leaning over talking to the guy with the glass. I can't remember his name. He said, hell Hydra. That's how it would be for here. You take on the mark of the beast, you are in essence saying, hell Satan. That's what you, in essence, are saying. You are saying, I'm not for the kingdom. I'm not for God. I don't care. Mark me. I'll do whatever. That's scary. That's scary. And here it says here, if you want to be separated from God, okay. God the, the, the writer said he will grant your request for you to be separated with him. I want to use this as an example of being separated from God. It's Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31, reading your study time. It's basically, and I'm going to paraphrase it, okay? It's basically the story of the rich man and Lazarus, where every morning, Lazarus, the rich man would leave from his house and he would step over Lazarus, right? He could have gave Lazarus something to eat. He, Lazarus, I believe, was homeless. He didn't have no food, no place to stay. So he could have given him something, but he didn't. So the Bible says they both died, right? Uh, Lazarus went to, I think it calls it Abraham's bosom, which pretty much is heaven, right? But the rich man went to hell. So the rich man asked, asked uh, Abraham, he said, hey, can you tell uh, Lazarus to dip his hand in some cool water dip his finger in cool water and just let it come down and just let it touch my tongue so I could feel just some cool water because he's being tortured. It was so hot there. You know, it's called the lake of fire for a reason. And Abraham tells him, no, he can't do that. He, he, he can't do that. He said, there's a gulf that separates heaven from hell. He can't cross over there to you and you can't cross over here to him. There's something that splits heaven from hell. You can't cross it. You, you, can't need, you can't cross over to the other side. So if you're in heaven, you can't cross over into hell. And if you're in hell, you can't cross over to heaven because there's a divider right there. So he kept giving them different things to say. And, and, and at the end, they weren't, doing, they weren't gonna do anything for the rich man. I think one of the... Uh, one of the uh, things that he said that Abraham said was you have plenty of opportunity to do these things and you did 
So now you want it to be done. And so in essence, they didn't do nothing for him. They didn't try to help him with his, Abraham didn't help him with his torment. He didn't try to make it easier. They just left him right there where he was. So the rich man was in paradise. I mean, I'm sorry, Lazarus was in paradise and the rich man was suffering for all eternity. That's how it's gonna be. That's an example of a separation from being separated from God. And that's how it is if you take on that mark of the beast. That's why it's so important to make sure your salvation is secure. So if the rapture takes place before then, you won't have to worry about this. But this is one of those moments. Remember when I said a while back that everybody has a point, has a, has a moment in their life where you got to take a stand. And taking that stand could very well cost you your life. Guess what? If you're around during that time, if you're saved during the tribulation period, this is one of those moments where you're going to take that stand. You're going to have to make a decision. Hey, are you going to take on the mark of the beast or are you going to become a martyr, which is dying for a cause? You got to make that decision. So very well, yes, not taking that mark will cost you your life. It could very well cost you your life. Absolutely. Absolutely, it can. Absolutely, it can. You know, I was talking to my dad not too, uh, not too long ago. And he talked about one of our cousins, how he knew how to survive out in the woods. <laughs> That's how you better be. You better learn how to survive without, you're going to have to learn how to survive without some things during that time. If you're here, you might have to learn how to do it. But you better not take on that mark because if you do, that's a wrap, partner. And there's and that's one thing that there's no coming back from if you do that. Can't come back from that. There's no coming back from it. Amen. So, guys, that's it for this episode of The Mark of the Beast. Again, we're going to, when we come, when we get to Revelation 13, we'll go into further depth about it. We'll, we'll um, We'll go over it again, and we might even have some more information concerning it. But this is just like a, a tease, so to speak, of what's to come. I think I discussed a lot of the main parts, but you know, we'll we'll go a little, we'll try to go a little further in depth when we actually get to it in Revelation 13. Okay. And then of course we'll talk about the false prophet when we get to him. So uh, guys, that's it for this episode of Mark, uh, this episode. Uh, of the mark of the beast. But before we go, you know, um, you know what I'm going to do. This is our time when we want to offer salvation to you because it is so important. We see so many things that are going on right now. And we want to make sure that our salvation is secure. We want to make your salvation and election sure, as I said last week, how the old people say because in this day and age, we want to make sure that if anything happens, you got a spot in the kingdom. And when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you already know, hey, no matter what happens, I am not taking on the mark of the beast. My salvation, my hope is in Lord Jesus. It's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when Nebuchadnezzar, when, uh, Nebuchadnezzar sent out that rule saying everyone has to worship this statue. And they said, oh, no, we can't do that. We, we are not going to worship this statue. We only worship God. We're not doing that. And guess what? That's how it's going to be. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if by chance a time comes, if by chance you're here and that it's time, it, we're in that period where with the mark of the beast is being and you've got to make a decision, you, you already going to have made up your mind, man. You might as well go ahead on, do what you're going to do, because I'm not taking on that mark. I'd rather die than take that mark. And guess what? That's a real decision to make. And you got some people who, who will gladly lay their life down for Jesus because they'd be like, the Lord laid his life down for me. I will do the same for him. And then you're going to have some people who are like, oh, no, I want to live. I want to live. Those are the people that don't have faith to believe. The Bible says you got to have faith small. You have faith small as a mustard seed. So if you got the faith enough to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when that time comes, if you're here, you you already know, you your decision is going to be well. You don't take me now because I'm not I'm not bowing down to you. I'm not taking on the mark. 
you know, so, but we want to believe that if you, if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to believe that if the rapture takes place beforehand, you're going to be up on out of here. So you won't have that to worry about. Amen. So this is what I want you to do. Just bow your heads with me, close your eyes, and let's just pray the simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Lord Jesus, I lay my life down for you. My life is now in your hands. I submit to you. Make me, shape me, and mold me into the person who you call me to be. My life is now in your hands. In the mighty name of Lord Jesus, I pray, and I thank you, Father. Amen. Guys, we're going to believe that if you pray that simple prayer, you have just now transferred over from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And we believe that now your spot is reserved on the other side. We believe that now your name is now written in the Lamb's book of life. And as I said, we believe that any son or daughter who has accepted Jesus as his Lord, his or her, I'm sorry, Lord and Savior, we believe that now there's a party in heaven because you have come home. God will begin to celebrate the fact you have come home. So, and, and now guys, as, as I said, if you've prayed that prayer and you've come, come home, come to the kingdom, pray and ask God to send you to the church where he, desire, where he desires you to be. Because everything as we see in the end times, everything that says church is not church. And there are a lot of good churches, excuse me. You may walk in and see a very good church, but guess what? God will tell you that it's a good church. Don't get it wrong. It's a good church. Very good church. My presence is there. My patent, my representative, my mouthpiece lives what he preaches. But it's still not the place that I have for you. I have another place for you. So when God leads you away from a church, it might not necessarily be it's a bad church. It could be that it could be he just wants you to plant somewhere else. So you never know. But the most important thing is pray and ask God where he wants you to be. OK, now, I know I said last week I was going to talk about a particular scripture in Zechariah where a lot where you make your decision whether or not you believe this. There are some people that believe that this scripture in Zechariah is a description of the Antichrist. And you have some people who believe it's not a description of the Antichrist. These things represent, different, represent um, have a different meaning. They, they symbolize something else. So I know I said I was going to take a look at it, but because this episode with the mark kind of ran a lot longer. So what I'll do is the following week, that's where I'll bring up the scripture in Zechariah. So we'll take a look at it next week. And I'm trying to get us a special guest to come on to the show so we can have a little discussion about the Antichrist. I'm trying to, um, hopefully everything will work out. We can bring him on and man, we're going to have us a good time in the word. So but anyway, guys, that's it for this episode. Guys, I love you. Have a blessed week. Please be safe out there. Stay prayed up. Make sure to spend some time in the word, man. Don't get too, don't let the cares of this world boggle you down. I don't, I, I can testify. I've been that way uh, this past week. I've let a lot of things boggle me, kind of keep me from the word. And I got to get myself back on track. That's just me letting you see me, letting you see my struggle because I'm not perfect and I'm not holier than that. I struggle just like everybody else, but at least I can admit it. You got some people out here that can't admit it. They just think they're perfect. I'm not perfect. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one perfect person. And his name is Jesus Christ. So, but make sure to spend some time with God. Spend some time in the word. Spend some time in prayer. Make, make sure to spend some time with him because a lot of things that's coming up on the horizon we need God. More. We need we need him, but we're going to need him more than ever with some of the things that's coming up. OK, so 
make sure to spend some time with God. That's all I'm saying. Spend some time in prayer, spend some time in the word. And man, begin to teach your children about the word of God. Begin to teach your children some of the things about what's going on in Revelation, because God forbid, we might beat and got up on out of here and their generation is the one that might have to go through and see some of these things. So they make make sure to, that they get have their own relationship with God. OK, it's our job. It's, it's our job. It's all the generations, the parents to do that. So make sure to do that, guys. OK, so I love you. You guys have a blessed week. Next week, we'll cover uh, Zach, uh, the scripture in Zechariah. You decide for yourself. Is it the Antichrist or how he looks or is it symbolize something else? I'll let you decide for yourself. Love you guys. Be blessed out there. I'll see you next week with another fantastic episode of Last Things Podcast, where we are on a journey to truth. See you guys. <music>